guys, and welcome to our first video in Unit 7 on Physical and Chemical Oceanography. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at factors affecting the chemical composition of seawater. Now, oceans cover about 70% of the Earth's surface, and as you might be aware of already, not all of the oceans is 100% water. There are going to be different things dissolved in that water, and those things are important because that's going to ultimately affect the different kinds of life that we find living in the oceans, as well as their distribution. So in this video, we have two essential questions. Our first question is going to be, what effect do evaporation and precipitation have on salinity? And we'll go over what salinity is and what salts are here in a second. And also taking a look at how volcanic activity, runoff, and atmospheric dissolution affect the chemical composition of seawater. So before we can talk about salinity, it's important for us to have an understanding about what is meant by the term salt. Now, you might be familiar with table salt already or sodium chloride, but that's not the only salt that exists. So just looking at this periodic table of elements, you don't have to memorize the whole thing, but just something I wanted to touch on was the concept that atoms and molecules have a tendency to either give up or gain electrons, and that's going to give them charge. So we're to just look at the atoms that we find on the left side of this chart. These guys typically have a tendency to give up or lose electrons, and because of that, they're going to have more of a positive charge, while these guys on this side have a tendency to gain electrons, which is going to give them more of a negative charge. And any time an atom or a molecule gives up or gains an electron, we're going to call these things ions. So all that an ion is, is an atom or a molecule with a positive or negative charge, and that was a result of either giving up or gaining an electron. So ions that you might be familiar with already are sodium and chloride. So sodium, which is Na, because it's on that left side of the periodic table, it has a tendency to lose an electron, it typically is going to have that positive charge. So we call that guy a sodium ion. Chlorine, on the other hand, Cl, has a tendency to gain an electron, so that's going to give it that negative charge, so we'd call this guy a chloride ion. Now, if you bring a positive and negative charge close enough together, what do they do? Well, they attract, and they're going to form what's called an ionic bond. And any time that they bond together, they're going to form what's known as a salt. So all that a salt is is any compound formed when two ions bond together because of that positive and negative charge. So here we have sodium chloride, a salt that you're probably very familiar with. Now, if we were to look at the composition of seawater, we'd notice that about 96.5% of seawater is just water, or H2O. The other 3.5% are going to be various types of salts, or ions. So what sorts of salts are we talking about? Well, we're to just zoom in here. We notice that most of it is what we just talked about, sodium chloride. That's why if you ever get seawater in your mouth, it tastes very salty. Most of it is sodium chloride. But the other types of salts or ions can be sulfate, calcium, potassium, magnesium. All these things are going to make up what we call the salinity of the water. So because about 35 grams of salt, of these salts are going to be found in about 1,000 grams of seawater, we say that the salinity of seawater is typically about 35 parts per thousand, or we can abbreviate that using the symbol that you see here. So typically, seawater is going to be 35 parts per thousand, but different factors can either increase that number or decrease it. So what sorts of factors can affect salinity? Well, one of them is going to be evaporation. So here in this picture, we have a lagoon. And all that a lagoon is is a body of water that is cut off from the rest of the ocean. So here's our lagoon. And you notice in the background here, we might have a coral reef, let's say, that's separating it so water can't come in and out. So as that water in the lagoon heats up, that water is going to evaporate, but it's going to leave the salts behind. So how does that affect the salinity? The salinity is going to increase. So evaporation of water increases the concentration of salt, leading to water that we can call hypersaline. The prefix hyper just meaning above. So it's above the typical salinity of 35 parts per thousand. A great example of this that we see is the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is a body of water found near Palestine and Jerusalem. And this is an area where water feeds in from rivers, bringing dissolved salts into it, but then that water gets stuck there until it evaporates, and then it leaves those salts behind. So over time, tons of salt has been dropped off in the Dead Sea, the water evaporates, and that means that the salinity goes higher and higher. In fact, there's about 10 times more salt in the Dead Sea than there is in the ocean, so about 350 parts per thousand as opposed to 35. That's why it's called the Dead Sea, you typically don't find life living there. Now, another thing that can affect salinity is going to be precipitation. Precipitation is going to have the reverse effect. As it rains or snows, that's going to bring fresh water, and that's going to dilute some of the salt and decrease salinity. This is a similar effect that we see in estuaries. So in this estuary, this is going to be where, let's say, freshwater systems, rivers, streams, lakes lead out to the ocean. So that's going to decrease the salinity of the water. We end up what's called brackish water here because it's not salt water, it's not fresh water, it's kind of a mixture in between. We also find that we can change salinity in areas near the Arctic where we might have a lot of ice melting. As that ice melts, it's going to dump a lot of fresh water into the ocean, and that's going to decrease the salinity. 
Now, salts are not going to be the only thing that we find inside ocean water. So if you are familiar with the water cycle, you know that water is always moving from the oceans up into the atmosphere, down into nearby rivers, lakes, and streams, running off back into the ocean. And with that, it's going to bring other various substances with it. So what other factors can affect seawater composition? Three major ones that we're going to take a look at are going to be volcanic activity, runoff, and atmospheric dissolution. And these things can affect the composition of seawater locally. In other words, in that area wherever these things are occurring. So if we're to start with volcanic activity, anytime a volcano erupts, it's going to release gases out into the atmosphere. What's going to be inside those gases or what sort of gases are we talking about? We're going to be looking at hydrogen chloride, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide. All these gases are going to get released into the atmosphere. Now, what does this have to do with the oceans? Well, as these gases make their way into the atmosphere, they're going to get dissolved in some of the water that's in the atmosphere as condensation, and eventually they're going to precipitate. That means that they're going to make their way down into either the ground or into the oceans, but either way, that's going to change the chemical composition of water. The same thing even happens with underwater volcanoes. They're going to release the same sorts of gases, and those things will get added into the oceans locally wherever that volcano is located. One gas in particular that these volcanoes release is chlorine gas. Now, if you get these, the chlorine being released, that's ultimately what's going to be a major source of those chloride ions we were talking about before. Remember that chloride ions make up the bulk of the salts. A lot of that chloride ions come from erupting volcanoes, either underwater or above. Runoff will be another way that we can change the chemical composition of water. So all that runoff is is when water drains from land into the ocean. Now, this can be a great thing. As water falls on land, as it runs off, uh, through groundwater or along the surface, it's going to bring different nutrients with it, minerals, things that the organisms need to survive. That might increase productivity of, uh, let's say, the phytoplankton, which will add more food and biomass for the rest of the uh, food web. But another thing that runoff can bring with it and change the composition are going to be pollutants. So if that water runs through a nearby farm, it might bring pesticides and fertilizers with it. If that water comes from an urban area where there's a lot of cars and uh, machinery and industry, it might bring oils with it. So that can have a negative impact on the local marine environment. Even if the pollutants are at a very low level, it's still a danger to the marine ecosystem. That is because of something known as biomagnification. So we're to look at this illustration here. Let's say this nearby coal plant is going to pollute or release these gases. And in those gases are going to be something like mercury. Mercury is very toxic. Well, as that mercury makes its way into the marine ecosystem, it might be at a very low concentration, but it can build up as it moves through the food chain. So if just a little bit gets picked up by our krill here, that krill might be eaten by a consumer, let's say a salmon. Well, that salmon's not going to eat just one krill. Let's say it eats a thousand krill. So therefore, it's going to get a thousand times more of that mercury inside its body. Then if a trout comes by and let's say eats 10 salmon that have that, now it's going to get a buildup of even more. And then when that trout gets eaten by a bigger, let's say a halibut here, a top consumer, it's going to get, let's say, eat 10 of those trout, it's going to get even more. So each step in a food chain, the amount of mercury or any pollutant is going to build up, and we call that biomagnification. To magnify means to make bigger, and bio means we're talking about living things. So some pollutants may be low in concentration to begin with, but as it moves up through that food chain, it's going to build up and it's going to accumulate. One case that we saw this happen in, in history is the Minamata Bay disaster. So Minamata Bay is a bay right off the coast of Japan, and there was a factory, the Chiso factory, which was manufacturing fertilizers. What they were doing was were releasing mercury, low amounts of mercury, into the nearby Minamata Bay, which then eventually made its way into the food chain. In around 1932, 1968, people began to show symptoms of mercury poisoning, so having neurological disorders, paralysis, and in some cases, death. The cause of that was due to biomagnification through the food web, and eventually these people were eating shellfish and getting mercury poisoning from it. So runoff in itself can cause a chemical composition change in the seawater. If those things are pollutants, that's not good for the humans living in that area, but also not the organisms living in that marine environment. Now, the final factor that we'll talk about that can impact seawater composition is going to be atmospheric dissolution, or in other words, gases dissolving into the oceans from the atmosphere. Now, typically, gases in the atmosphere are going to be at equilibrium with gases dissolved in the ocean just due to diffusion. In other words, there's usually going to be about equal amounts in both. And that's because as some gases move in and dissolve, some gases will move out. So here are some carbon dioxide atoms. Every time one moves in, one might pop out. So they're always going to have about equal. If I increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 
that means more are going to move in than out, so then eventually they'll balance themselves out. That will increase the amount of gases inside the ocean. Now, what sort of things can impact this where we don't get equilibrium? Well, one thing is the solubility of the gas. Some gases are more able to dissolve in the oceans than others. So if it's not able to dissolve well, it's not going to have a high concentration inside the oceans. If it easily dissolves in water, we'd expect more of it inside that water as it dissolves in. The temperature of the water can also impact this. So typically colder temperature water can hold more gases than warmer temperature. So you, we're usually gonna find more, let's say oxygen and carbon dioxide in the polar areas than in the tropical areas where the water is warmer. And finally, salinity. The amount of salts will impact it. The more salt or the more salinity or the higher the salinity, the less gases it can hold. The less salinity or the lower the salinity, the more gases it can hold. Now, what gases are most dissolved in oceans that you need to be most concerned with? There are three big ones that you should know. The first one is nitrogen gas. That nitrogen, as it makes its way into the oceans or dissolves in, there are going to be bacteria that can fix it, or in other words, take that nitrogen and then change it into a form that other organisms can use. Why do we need nitrogen? Well, all organisms use nitrogen for their DNA. They use it for proteins. So without nitrogen, organisms can't live. Another important gas is oxygen. As you're aware, without oxygen, you can't live. We need it for respiration. So as that oxygen dissolves into the oceans, organisms can then use that oxygen to do cellular respiration. And then finally, carbon dioxide, another essential gas, especially in the process of photosynthesis. We're going to use that, and that's going to kick off the productivity for organic compounds that other organisms can use. So at this point, you should be able to do the following. You should be able to outline the effects of evaporation and precipitation and how that affects salinity. You should have a pretty good idea about what salinity is. And then lastly, be able to demonstrate an understanding of the effects of volcanic activity, runoff, and then atmospheric dissolution and how these things affect the chemical composition of seawater. Thanks for watching.